When it comes to human behavior, then there is really only one way to find out if someone is truthful or deceptive. All you have to do is listen, really listen to what is said. More than 90% of the deceivers in my own academic research were successful simply because their counterparts did not listen to what they were saying. The clues, once you know what to look for, are so obvious that it is astounding that so many liars get away unchallenged. If you think you can do better by analyzing nonverbal communication, be my guest, but don't be surprised if you miss the mark. Most of the subject matter experts I have interviewed for this channel say exactly the same. It's all in the words. In this context, my guest today is Isabel Piconel, a forensic linguist who literally detects deception for a living and she does so under the umbrella of her company QED Forensics, which works for the corporate and intelligence sectors. But to survive in this unforgiving niche, Isabel has no room for errors. There are no second chances and the prospect of a company is only as good as her last analysis. This means that the stakes for her can't be much higher. It also means that Isabel had to develop a toolkit robust enough to guarantee a near 100% success rate. If you want to know what her toolkit is and how she applied it to solve a million dollar fraud, feel free to watch the following interview. But why words? The common understanding is that in order to find out if someone is lying, all you have to do is to observe body language. A scratch on the nose, averted eyes, fidgeting, all signs of deception, right? If that's the case, then why do experts from more and more law enforcement agencies focus on the words? As counterintuitive as it sounds, people have much less control over what they are saying than they think. We instinctively tailor our verbal communication for a specific audience, for the medium by which we are communicating, for the situation in which we are communicating, and most importantly, for the purpose for which we are communicating. Each of these aspects impact what we say or write and how we say or write it, and it's all done in milliseconds. To make matters worse, some words are processed in a different part of the brain and largely evade our conscious awareness. This is exactly what makes them so valuable for deception detection. If you want to do a little self-experiment to verify what I just said, go to saltcubeanalytics.com, click on the words in the menu bar, and scroll down till you find join us for a little experiment. So while amateurs focus on nonverbal communication when it comes to deception detection, true professionals from law enforcement and academia focus on the words we say. After the interview, I will give you an example of how a little word gave away the liar in a real FBI investigation. But for now, let's listen to Isabel to find out how she solved the million dollar fraud. Good, and here we go. Isabel Picornel, do I pronounce your name correctly? That, well, it's close enough. It's a Mallorquin <laughs> family name, and so... Okay pronunciation is difficult <laughs> yes and we just we just discussed prior to this uh, me hitting the record button you have a slight accent so maybe you repeat again you are your background uh, you come from yes um i am spanish my family is from mallorca but i was born in the philippines and i spent the first 18 years of my life there and so what you're hearing is an American Filipino accent, but I have been Very in, interesting. I've been in the UK for over thirty years, and it hasn't left. Okay, I always like a kind of nuance in the in the accents. It, it sounds very nice. Now, <laughs> coming you. to your coming to your your bio here, yeah, and I try to find information from you, which is available amongst others on your own website, of course. You have a PhD in Forensic Linguistics from the Aston University. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Mm -hmm. You're also a visiting uh, fellow there, also for, for uh, Forensic Linguistics. You are the president of the International Association for Forensics and Legal Linguistics. Mm -hmm. You are a member of the Germanic Society of Forensic Linguistics. You're a, a certified fraud examiner and you are an expert. You have an expert witness certificate. So I'm guessing you're spending quite some time in front of the courts, well, um, right? Um, some time, it's not that much. I, most of my work is civil law, 
focused and yeah. most of those cases don't end up in court okay you are the author of a number of uh, research papers on forensic linguistics i found one you co-authored with albert albert fry which is also quite a, a known name in that uh, in that field you are the co-author and editor of this book which is called methodologies and challenges in forensic linguistic casework and there is one chapter you were kind enough to present to me with a perfect example on the power of uh, f uh, forensic linguistics but also on the power of the words yeah which mm -hmm. is so highly underestimated right mm -hmm. you have also developed your own contextual audience analysis toolkit and i would like to come back to that a little bit later right and i think your main occupation now is as director of qed forensics maybe you can briefly explain to us what that is and what you do well qed limited or qed forensics is a small company based in the channel islands and we offer um, companies and uh, the investigative and intelligence sector. Uh, we offer them support using forensic linguistics analysis. So uh, largely focused on fraud investigations, uh, where we assist the investigations from the very earliest start of the investigation and all the way to court with uh, forensic linguistics evidence if necessary. Okay, as far as you have the liberty to, um, could you elaborate on one example? Of, uh, for example, the uh, example I have in the book that you have uh, involved a trail of 15 emails, which was part of a fraud investigation. And um, the investigator who I'd worked with before has picked up some forensic linguistics knowledge. And he came to me uh, with these emails um, with a feeling that something was not right about them. And so he didn't know what the problem was. But these emails were collected as part of a fraud investigation and he wanted my input into them. And uh, my analysis showed that actually the whole trail of 15 emails had been falsified. They had been deliberately created to provide false inform financial information um, of which this fraud investigation was looking at. Okay, let's not forget to really come back to that example because I found it especially interesting because it's it, it goes way over and beyond semantics. It, it's a real detective work, right? It, it's more than just forensic linguistics, well, just, huh? uh, forensic linguistics, yeah, it, 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 it crosses over in a number of other fields. So let's not forget, I have the book in front of me too, as a reminder to, uh, to do so, okay? Now, to, to kind of frame our conversation, right? So I have three, three little chapters, so to speak, yeah? I would, if you can, yeah, I would like to discuss briefly nonverbal communication, yeah? Then mm -hmm. we jump over into deception in general, can be nonverbal, can be linguistic, can be anything, yeah? And then we jump into lim linguistics, mm -hmm. okay? Now, in regards to nonverbal communication, if you start here, right? So there are a mass of, so there's a ton of incorrect beliefs, stereotypes, myths going on. Many of the books you see behind me, which I started reading like 20 years ago, yeah? Um, uh, propagate this um, yeah this misrepresentation and to foster a kind of false belief in in the public yeah and these false beliefs are are spread I don't know if you know there's a there's a research group called the Global Deception Detection Research Team it's a long name yeah mm -hmm. they did research in 75 countries into stereotypical uh, deception cues which are incorrectly associated with uh, deception right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the population of those 75 countries, and I give only one example, they believe if I cannot look you in the eye, I'm a liar. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we know from research that's absolutely not true. Yeah? That's true. So coming now I give the, the, the microphone to you. Um, do you have any exposure, any experience, any, any research in regards to um, nonverbal communication? 
personally, no, because I'm a linguist. So, um, but as part of my PhD, I did look into uh, the research behind that. And the research well, behind that and is consistent with uh, also uh, psychological theories as to how deceptive people behave. And the problem with all that, uh, with uh, nonverbal behavior, uh, is that it starts with the theory as to how people who lie feel about their lies. And then it moves on into identifying features, behavioral or emotional, which should be associated with how people feel about their lives. So, for example, the general idea that people feel guilty about lying. And so the way they behave, uh, they don't look at you, uh, they, they fidget, um, they, they, they act nervously. All of that is based on the theory that people do feel guilty about lying, but there's actually no proof that that is true. And what we do find, and this is uh, supporting what you say about all the deception studies across 75 different countries, is that the way people think about deceptive behavior is culturally directed. It's based on the culture. And the idea that people feel guilty about lying goes back to early Christian uh, religion. Uh, the early ideas that uh, lying was a sin and all the associated, associated behaviors with the lie resulting in guilt, nervousness, etc. But what the science does show is that some people may feel guilty, uh, most people don't. And so you have this disconnect between the theory as to how people should feel and should act when lying, and then the actual science as to how they actually behave. So this is a very long explanation as to why, um, although it's not my area of expertise, I have looked into it because part of my research is into the, the verbal examples of guilt, um, uh, fear, etc. And it just doesn't stack up with the theories. Yeah, I think that's in line with the cognitive load. It's always, it's also very often claimed that lying produces cognitive load. Um, but there are also different, dif different um, uh, indicators here pointing in the opposite direction, right? So depending on what type of lies, mm -hmm. right, in which situation, how stake, how high the stakes are, etc, etc, many, many lies probably do not, you know, cause as, cogn as high a cognitive load as is often assumed. And it also depends on uh, what type of lie you're creating. If you're creating a lie from scratch that would, with absolutely no memory of your behavior or your activities associated with that type of lying, it will create a heavier cognitive load than if you lie by referring to a memory that you already have, which is a true memory, but it's been yeah. imported into a false context. I think you're, you're scratching on something very important here. Yeah? So the lie truth dichotomy, right? Mm -hmm. Like black and white. This is a lie. This is this is truth. Mm -hmm. It's basically not existent because it's so intermingled, right? That partially truthful. I mean, we can even we can even lie by telling the truth, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a vastly complex field. I think that's one of the reasons why we do not have universal. Deception cues, neither linguistic ones nor, nor non-verbal ones. Exactly, right. you're correct, yes. Uh, we are all so different. Um, our backgrounds, our experience, uh, the way we grew up, uh, you know, whether we consider lies to be wrong or not wrong. And also, uh, what's important to remember is that evolution uh, 
has created supports the de evolution, the development of lying, uh, of deception. Uh, it wouldn't exist today if it wasn't evolutionarily helpful to humans. And so, if we have been evolving for millions of years in uh, facilitating deception, we're certainly not going to come up with a one shape fits all. Yeah, since, since you mentioned evolution, yeah. So when I started um, looking into, I mean, I'm a behavior, not, I'm, I'm a manager and as such, I'm not a technician, so I work with people. So I started to be interested in human behavior 10, 15 years ago, right? And as I, I think I went the, the usual way via, via nonverbal communication. Before I realized that nonverbal communication is not really in, it's not really a useful tool when it comes to deception. Yeah. So I started with nonverbal uh, communication, but then I discovered evolutionary psychology, right? And once I started to regard human behavior via the lens of evolutionary psychology, and I only bring this up because you mentioned evolution, right? Um, many things started, many behaviors that I couldn't explain started to make sense, right? So what's, what, what's your view on our modern skulls housing ancient minds and that our behavior from the day is basically still tailored to a situation where we kind of fought the saber-toothed tigers to make it a bit, to exaggerate a little bit. I have read about that. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as I'm aware, and based on what I've read, yes, we do have, is it in the hypothalamus? hippocampus I can't I don't know but there's a part of a brain of the brain which is very ancient and it houses our reaction uh, yeah. it controls our fight and yeah. fight or flight reactions yeah. and, and that's absolutely yes. fascinating yes which which still governs our behavior today it doesn't matter if you go shopping if if you are in a dating situation or if it just if it just cross the street huh? Which is why I always like to mention, you know, although nonverbal communication is probably not very well suited to deception detection, it can tell us a lot about behavior. Right? Mm -hmm. For example, if you are a hundred meters away from me and you're afraid, I can recognize this emotion even without looking in your face, right? So our, our nonverbal communication, number one, is purposeful because if you're afraid, there's probably a, a likelihood that what you are afraid of is also a danger to me. So that there's a, mm -hmm. you know, well, and it's very expressive. I can tell you, uh, in my reaction when I'm afraid or when something hap suddenly happens is freeze. I freeze, which mm -hmm. is not convenient if something dangerous is coming towards you because you would expect <laughs> to, f to flee. And I know some yeah. people who do flee, but my automatic reaction yeah. is always to just freeze and to go quiet and to just... <laughs> I suppose assess quietly. Yeah. I hope you don't react like this when a big truck comes towards you when you cross the zebra. This is the problem. I probably would, <laughs> and I'd end up underneath it. Okay. Yes. I hope seriously not. Okay. Now you were kind enough to send me your PhD, which I have read twice, and I noticed, of course, that you spent quite a number of pages on deception in general. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about deception, very briefly, um, again, misconceptions. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically flipping a coin. It's 54 percent. We know all that as so the accuracy. And that includes professionals, mm -hmm. most professionals, um, doesn't matter in law enforcement, judges, whatever. Yeah? So 54 percent. And I heard a good one. Those four percent is only because as so there's four extra percent. So not 50, 50, but 54 percent is only because some people are so bad liars that even a blind person would recognize if the, if the person would be lying. And so it, we, are not, we are not really, really great. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the reason is supposed to be that we are looking at stereotypical deception cues, right? I saw in your PhD that you also uh, uh, quoted um, De Paolo. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your first name? Bella uh, De Paolo. Bella De Paolo to which I have reached out for an interview request, but she told me she's no longer interested in deception detection. She is now researching single life. Yeah, so life as a single, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a pity because I have 
I have, I don't know how many research papers from, from her, right? But she kind of, she kind of uh, counter argues that by saying we are actually quite good deception detec detectors. We can differentiate between truth and lies, right? We only don't make this, this last mental leap if we don't have more evidence, right? So seeing all the research that you have done in regards to deception and potentially deception detection via your PhD, via, via, via your PhD, right? So what's your general, if you can encapsulate it, yeah? When it comes to, what, what's, your, what's your general conclusion encapsulating your own view on deception and de deception detection? Well, what I tried to do in my PhD, and, and this was, you know, took seven years because I kept reaching dead ends and I was not finding anything. And, and actually, in the end, it was quite by accident that I settled on uh, uh, the approach that I took. And by the way, um, just to say my PhD was on deceptive linguistic strategies in written witness statements. And what I tried to do was to standardize the analysis, eventually with a view to automating it. That was, it never happened, but that was the original idea. And so I wanted to create a set of criteria which would be objective and it would take away the decision from the analyst whether or not deception was going on. And so what I did in the end was I identified a set of linguistic strategies that are commonly associated with deception in written witness statements. But that is actually an information provision strategy. So you're looking at the way the liar lies in witness statements and there are few options open to them. So this is a, a person who is writing a monologue, a story on their own. They are not facing anyone. They have no visual cues as to how well their lie is going or not going. And so uh, there, it's much more difficult to lie, I think, in a, state, a witness statement because you have no idea how good it's going. And so, what, after all this, and still with what I'm developing about um, deception approaches, what I'm looking at is the strategy that a person uses to provide information and how that strategy fits or doesn't fit with the context how the information fits or doesn't fit with the context. So what I've found is it's actually we're removing the idea or I'm removing the idea of a lie by looking at the information. And I then, with the current research I'm in, I'm looking at the comparison of um, lying strategies from the view of the addressee, the, oh, well, the person being lied to, and the person lying. So I'm looking at both points. Um, and again, a very long way of answering your question is, I do not subscribe to the psychologist view of any of the emotions being identified as features of lying, even in linguistic features. So looking at language choices that an individual will make that are associated with the emotions they feel. My view is it's all about information. What I can provide, what I can't provide, and more importantly, what I need to provide, depending on the context. Uh, so that's the view I've come to on analyzing deception. If you say emotions, I mean emotions. First of all, I'm, I'm I find it very interesting to hear that you can identify. Well, yes, you can identify emotions via the high strata, so not not via the substatement analysis, but because it's obvious in the text the emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but emotions, let's say like fear, 
a guilty person may show exactly the same signs of fear as an innocent person who is afraid not being believed, right? So we, we potentially can spot emotions via nonverbal communication, via verbal communication, but we can't, we never can identify the cause, yes. right? So that, that disqualifies emotions as, uh, as you know, deception, de deception uh, cues, right? But what I wanted to ask you, oops, because I'm personally interested in omissions, right? So, of course, there are different types of lies, and we are not necessarily talking about white lies, which are simply a social lubricant, but about lies where it really matters, where the stakes are high, either for the liar or for for the adresse of the lie, that type of lies, right? My, my own master thesis was about indicators of omissions during high stakes negotiations, right? And I grouped under the umbrella of avoidance, ambiguity, concealment, dodging questions, equivocation, evasions, half truth and vagueness. Yeah. And for each of those, you can find hundreds of mm -hmm. research papers just for each one of those. Yeah. But what I found was that, first of all, senior managers and negotiators, they don't like to outright lie. Yeah. It's much too risky. Yeah. It, when you let's say use omissions or those those avoidance strategies instead it offers uh, plausible deniability it's less ethnically questionable yeah it is more socially accepted and of course because you technically don't lie if there would be mm -hmm. any deception indicators you probably would show them less because again technically i'm not really lying yeah i'm just skipping over mm -hmm. over something yeah so in regards specifically in regards to omissions right did you find any indicators of omissions in your work with regards specifically to witness statements um yes okay. uh, and what is you're looking at uh there's a lot of studies on how people tell stories you've got labov who's uh, one of the big ones you know stories of personal experiences so how people narrate something that's happened to them. And if you think about it, that's exactly what a witness statement is. You're telling the story of what you personally experienced. Now, one of the, uh, and it's a good thing you reminded me, I've, n I've never developed this further, but in a witness statement, one of the indicators of something wrong, and I won't say lying, but let's say that something is not right there, is the use of the negative. The use of negatives to tell what didn't happen as part of the story. And if you think about it, that's not what a story is. The story is what did happen. And in my research, even today, um, what I found is if somebody is saying or using a negative to clarify, you know, um, I did not know he had a gun, for example, in the statement. Well, you want to know what's being missed out that provokes that clarification. So something is being omitted. It may not be a lie, uh, but it's being missed out. And it is important enough for the author to issue, uh, to mention in uh, the statement. Now, one of the, um, have to say, the statements I used for my PhD were all based on pre-police interviews. So these are situations where the person is either comes into the police station or is brought into the police station. Prior to interview, they're put in a room, they're given a piece of paper, and they're instructed to write what happened. So the information you're getting is what the author thinks is important. The problem with statements after the police interviews is the author now knows what the police want to know. And so this witness statement is then geared towards answering those questions. But in a pre-interview statement, all the information is what the author thinks is important to him or her. 
And so when you get negatives coming in, in the story, uh, refuting something or moving the story along by what didn't happen, you're then uh, looking at an omission there that hasn't been stated but is important enough to be clarified. So that, that's the only one I've come across. Hmm. I have a specific question here. Yeah? So negations is one of your four or one of the four items that you found in the potentially indicative of, mm. of deception, right? Those are verb, verb strings, cognitive verbs, and indefinite mm. pronouns together with yes. negation, yeah? My question is, I know that you focus on written witness statements, but these could also be applied in verbal discourse, right? Theoretically, yes. Or do you see any, any reason? Theoretically, yes. Yeah. And uh, so what I'm looking at, verb strings and um, the other features you mentioned, these are all markers of ambiguity, which, you know, yeah. one of the things of hiding information or not is to make the information highly ambiguous. And there is information, uh, recent in, uh, research papers on um, business and financial meetings, which show that this is the strategy yeah. that uh, finance individuals, uh, these are fi uh, chief financial officers and auditors discussing um, falsified financial information. Yeah. And all this ambiguity is one of the features that characterize uh, lying in these discussions. Uh, now, nobody, n it doesn't mention negation, but I certainly, I. I see negation as part of that ambiguity creation. Uh, it gives the impression you're providing information, concrete information, but it actually doesn't. So I think it's all, you know, yeah. I, I don't see why that can't be explored. Because you said in financial, financial statements, yeah, you sent, you were kind enough to send me the PhD mm -hmm. from Holly Anderson, which is, focusing on deception in financial statements. And I'm aware of a couple of uh, research papers from the past, I don't have the names now, which go on the exact same topic. Yeah, so financial uh, uh, deception in financial statements Yeah, and how to, how to detect them was an interesting one. Yeah, uh, Coming very briefly back to those four items, so verbs, strings, negations, mm -hmm. cognitive verbs, and um, indefinite pronouns. Yeah, Just just to give one or two examples, yeah, words, word strings, for example, uh, started to walk or went mm -hmm. to call, right? Those are indicators that the person wanted to do something or started to do something, but it doesn't say anything about if the person completed that supposed act or activity, right? Negations you already, uh, you already mentioned. Cognitive words. So if I, if I encapsulate this correctly, so if a, imagined memories access, then cognitive verbs are more likely to occur because if you grab the information from actual memory, you would you would uh, refer to more to sensory experiences. Yeah, S uh, temporal sensory, uh, where you have been, etc. Yeah, do, do yeah. I do I kind of phrase this, this is, correctly? This is derived from reality monitoring. Uh, it is an exploration into how people... Now, it's not a study of deception. Reality monitor, monitoring explores how people remember false memories that may be dreams, fantasies. So it's the difference in clarity between mm -hmm. really actually experienced events and uh, memories that have uh, a cognitive origin. So I borrowed those features, but what I'm trying to do with them is not identifying the source, but again, uh, creating ambiguity because cognitive verbs is subjective information and you cannot verify subjective information. It is the safest type of information to provide how you feel, what you thought, what you remembered, because it's not verifiable. And so these are one of the information strategies adopted by liars. Yeah, you said it right. The safest, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah, of course, that the safest information to provide mm -hmm. because you can't verify it.
safer than you know actual and, ones. Yeah. So it, and it's in, the same yeah. with um, verb strings. Again, you know, it is if you th look at the what it's actually saying. There's it's subjective information. You started to do something doesn't mean you actually did it, and so plausible deniability. Exactly. You developed your own way of analyzing written statements, yeah. And I'm a little bit more interested in verbal statements, yeah. But your expertise is on written statements um, to analyze the statements on a substatement level, and we are talking here about marked mm -hmm. sentence structures. Maybe, first of all, you explain what it is. Well, a marked feature in linguistics is anything that is not usual construction. And I won't say normal, because it is normal, but its marked features are used far, far less than normal constructions. So, for example, uh, our normal construction of um, uh, an independent sentence, an independent clause, uh, I went to the cinema, is uh, our normal uh, linguistic construction in English, and we process that, the hearer processes that easily. If I then create a marked sentence out of it, for example, I say, um, when I went to the cinema, now, and I put that at the beginning of a sentence, that creates, that slows down the cognitive processing of the hearer because it is not the usual construction. The usual construction of an, uh, a dependent clause is at the end of the sentence rather than at the beginning. And so what this does in the individual processing this information is it slows down the understanding because it highlights, hang on a minute, this information is important and you have to pay attention to it. And it's the same for all marked features, that when you have a feature that is changed from its normal form into its rarer form, this slows down understanding, but it draws attention to the information being provided in the linguistic construction. So that's essentially what marked features or marked sentences are. Okay, so to put this into context, so a couple of, it's quite a while ago already. So when, when I was starting with linguistics, I was told, you know, statements have a profile. You need, like a story, you need a beginning, a middle, you know, where the, where the main activity happens mm -hmm. and an end. And if there's a discrepancy, for example, you have a very long beginning, a relatively short main uh, section, and then hardly any any uh, tail, there's something wrong. Yeah, And the argument is here, rightly so, that it is up to the analyst to determine where each section mm -hmm. ends and begins. And this is what makes uh, what the, the, the methodology that you are using um, superior to that approach because in because it's the author of the uh, the speaker or the writer who him or herself determined via the usage of marked mm -hmm. sentence structure where those episodes begin and at the same time end. That was actually a question. When you have a marked sentence structure, it's at the same time the beginning and the end, right? It, so, so it's the other way around. It's the end, but at the same time, also the beginning of the next episode, right? But then I still don't know where now which segment, let's say the beginning or the main segment, where that where that begins or ends. How how, how do you use the sentence the marked sentence structure? Well, for that? I don't subscribe to the theory that uh, narratives have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Uh, people just don't tell stories Agreed. like that. And, and they're often not linear. So somebody will be t telling a story, which is what I do all the time. I then go, hang on, I have to go back and clarify. So these are the problems with narratives, especially witness narratives, but uh, in any 
story or that's being or yeah narrative type structure uh, you don't have these clear um, definitions of beginning middle and end uh, so instead what I did was I look I didn't invent this mark structure it is in the um, uh, I discovered it in uh, the literature linguistics literature uh, from from the 70s and carrying on that people looking at uh, Marx structures but in nar in a narrative what I found was that uh, people inserted or used Marx structures uh, to identify very definite what I call episodes within the story and it all revolved around you know the same characteristics and that when people well in the narrative when you introduced new characters or the story moved to a new place these uh, were identified by the introduction of mark sentence structures so in um, at least witness statements, most of the statements I looked at started with a marked structure. Okay, uh, at about 10 a.m. on Tuesday the 23rd, or while I was walking to the supermarket, or uh, when I got to the office first thing this morning, and that was a feature of most of the witness statements I looked at, that they did start with these marked sentence structures. And it was highlighting time, place, uh, yeah, time, place, uh, which may be, if you think about it, may be influenced by watching television and what police statements sound like. You know, so you do get with witness statements, people wanting to be formal about it. And so you get this police speak being inserted into it. But carrying on with the rest of the story, um, what I did find was the use of Mark sentence structures that introduced, that closed a previous episode and opened the next episode although there were exam uh, examples of mark sentence structures that just closed and another mark sentence that just opened but what we're looking at is these features introduce episode boundaries so it actually in psychology the theory is that these marked sentence structures help us organize our short-term memory so when we get to the marked sentence structure that closes an episode, we then file that in short-term memory and we then open a new episode to carry uh, to analyze the rest of the information until you get to another marked sentence structure and it closes down that file and files it in short. So this is the psychological theory of why these structures occur um, but I certainly found that at least in narratives witness narratives they were very definitely opening and closing episode uh, episode features and in that these structures were associated with changes in people so all of a sudden you introduce a new person who's come in it's a mark sentence structure you move from one place to another place. It's a marked sentence structure. And it, it's really uncanny. Of, and we do it all subconsciously. However, I say that subconsciously, but I did read a paper by um, a Canadian linguist called Gary Prido at the University of Alberta that, um, that said that we had to learn these structures that they don't occur naturally to us because children when children tell stories they don't have them so it's something that we eventually learn when we tell stories and i thought that was interesting but i haven't followed that one up
maybe just to to simplify it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if I understood your work uh, correctly, then one of the markers for a marked sentence structure is when the subordinate clause mm -hmm. comes before the main clause, right? When a sentence which cannot stand on its own comes before a sentence which can stand on its own. Yeah. The other examples, I think you used the, the word then could also be a, a marker for a marked sentence structure, but a, a constructs like that. Yeah. Now, having just heard what you said, so what is then for you when you look for deception in written witness statements, what is the relevance of those marked sentence structures or episodes in that context well, for you? In the study I was looking at, which was, well, developing, which was linguistic strategies. Um, the problem with linguistic strategies is, well, the problem when you come to analyze linguistic strategies is they're not static. They change. And that's what the strategy is. You, you're following a certain form and you're adjusting the linguistics all the time. And when we do face-to-face, -face, uh, we are adjusting it all the time because we're looking for feedback as to how our story, lie, whatever is being received. And we have different linguistic strategies open to us to either uh, defend ourselves or promote the lie, depending on how we see the recipient receiving our story. Now, in written witness statement, as I said earlier, we don't have that. But we do have to change our linguistic strategies when we move from the truth to the lie. And the simple reason being is we cannot provide the same type of information. So we do have to adjust our linguistic strategy. And in a written witness narrative, using marked sentence structures to create episodes, we can linguistically profile every episode and then see as the story continues. So you're looking at a narrative as a series of episodes that follow each other. You can then see how the linguistic strategy is changing as the information changes. So you can start, for example, an entirely a, a truthful witness statement at the start, a lot of information, uh, very specific, certain uh, linguistic features, the pronouns being used, the association of pronouns with verbs, with other features. And then as the lie happens, you see a change in the way that certain features like pronouns interact with other features like verb strings, uh, the ambiguity features. Um, and so th having, linguist uh, having these uh, uh, linguistic features, these uh, marked sentence structures, which create episodes, which allow us to linguistically profile every episode actually gives us the development of the linguistic strategy. Um, so this is the reason behind it. So we're no longer having to analyze uh, statements on a whole statement. So basically, which involves, you know, counting, you know, there's how many I's, how many me's, how many all this, on a whole sentence, on a whole uh, document, you then, uh, which cannot provide the linguistic strategy. You know, you can't do that. All you can do is count features. You can't identify anything else. Um, and if you do identify anything else, you don't know where those features fit in the flow of, lingu of the linguistic strategies. But using marked sentence structures and episodes, you can do. Because one of the important things I want to find out, uh, find out is to demonstrate, is that... Um, Strategy is not linear. It goes all over the place, depending on, you know, what information we want to highlight, uh, how we want to talk about certain things, um, you know, what we want to say or we don't say. And it is the whole strategy that creates the lie. 
it is not any single point in the strategy. The lying, deception, is actually the entire outcome of uh, that communication. So if I understood you correctly, so no statement, or so very seldom, let's, let's be prudent, very seldom a whole statement is either a truth, is either truthful or a lie, right? And what you're saying is that the analysis of episodes, episodes allow you to pinpoint or to separate the areas where the statement is most likely to be truthful or most likely to be deceptive. Do um, I capture this correctly? Not, not exactly. Um, it can, it gives you high, creating episodes allows you to profile the, the, the strategy of that episode. And um, so you have as opposed, as opposed to the yes sorry as opposed to the whole statement yeah so you you identify the strategies in each episode as opposed to the strategies for the whole statement that's right so what you're identifying are the changes in strategies hmm. so you're identifying how the strategy is moving through the author's field of thought what i've identified are an two main linguistic strategies associated with deceptions and the features that characterize those strategies. Before I forget, can you name them? The first is I call prolix and ambiguous. This is where uh, the author uses a lot of words and a lot of ambiguity to provide much information. So the author appears to be very helpful by providing a lot of information Much of it is subjective, which cannot be verified, but they're appearing um, helpful. Cooperative. That's right, yeah. cooperative. And the second strategy is impersonal. And within that impersonal strategies, there are another, uh, there are about two or three minor strategies. And the impersonal strategy basically achieves deception by attributing the information to somebody else. So bearing in mind, this is supposed to be a statement of personal experience, personal observation, uh, the strategy, uh, the information comes from a third party uh, and not the author. Now, that's a very simplified way of saying it. Um, there are finer details. For example, in the impersonal strategy, it tends to be very specific. But again, it's very specific because there is plausible deniability. It's not me doing it. In the um, prolix and ambiguous, you can have a lot of very specific information, um, but they're associated with subjective information. And then what we're looking at, well, what I'm looking at is the balance of pronouns. So it's the use of pronouns and how they are associated with these other features. So in previous study, studies, there is very uh, much focus on high use of first person pronouns. This in theory is supposed to be immediate, so it's probably truthful because the author is associating with that information. However, what I found is in this prolix and ambiguous, you do have very high use of first person pronouns, but that use is safe because it's associated with ambiguous information, with very specific information that can be verified, but with subjective information that is safe because it's not verifiable because you mentioned pronouns yeah um there's a first person singular pronoun i me my etc etc yeah so there's so there's ample of research which seems to suggest that the usage or the 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 avoidance of the usage of the first person singular pronoun i 
indicates that the speaker or writer wants to be wants to put distance between him or herself and what's what's happening, right? So more or less could be a deception indicator, right? But you are saying actually, if I understood the your I think it was in, in your PhD or in the flexible liar, the paper that you wrote. But again, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah? I'm, I'm putting this out, out of my fragmented memory. Um, that doesn't seem to be necessarily true. Instead, uh, the, the more interesting ones are actually me and my, because it, it even further uh, elongates the, the distance. Yeah, Because me is a little bit further away from I, and my is even further away from me. Mm -hmm. Right, so the ownership, yeah. So did I did I understand this correctly? No, that's that's correct. Um, research, uh, there is research that that says that um, reduction in first person pronoun I indicates distancing and suggesting of deception. But you have to be careful with reading papers uh, that are very selective about their uh, background theories because there are just as many papers that show that high incidences of I is associated with deception. And uh, so uh, what I looked at was the collective I, me, uh, my, all those, pro instead of just first person pronouns. And um, yes, uh, there is a difference between I and me, basically with I being the initiator of the action and me having the action done to me. So there is this slight uh, separation. Uh, but my research found that the single most important indicator of deception was the use of my. Now, this may be unique to written witness statements. I've not read anything that comments on my or even studies my. But what I found in the written witness statements was when my appears, what you have is the removal of the individual as I and the focus on bits of me. So it's not me, it's bits of me. It's my hand, my hair, my clothes, my car. And again, that is, well, I don't, I don't have an explanation. I'm suggesting an explanation, uh, which is that by using my, you, you still have the person present, but it's not them. It's a bit of them. And so you introduce then this distancing uh, information, again, that uh, is rendered safer because there's no, well, there's, there's a reduction in a personal appearance. I, I don't know. Um, all I do is I describe what I find, and I don't have any real um, explanation for this use of my. Uh, sadly, uh, these type of witness statements are very, very difficult to obtain. And I was very lucky to obtain the 45 statements I had from a U.S. police force who collaborated with me. Uh, I have not been able to obtain similar statements since. And certainly in the UK, the police write the witness statements of individuals. So uh, I, you know, if, if there's anybody out there, any police force that would like to collaborate in a further study, providing witness statements like this, that the, the witnesses write themselves, then please get in contact. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we know what's the difference, what the, what's the challenge is when with police writing uh, the witness uh, witness statements, also the, the 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 reports after the interviews or during the interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot to be said about pronouns, but in the interest of time, I, I skip it because we already the interesting ones. I mean, mine. I said the first person uh, singular ones uh, we covered uh, very briefly. I saw that the word then 
is also a, a um, episode marker, marked sentence structure. Yeah. Interestingly, there is a former FBI, a former FBI special agent. He was working in the counter terrorism behavior analysis program. And today he is a professor on a, I think, I forgot the, the I forgot the university. He's already a 12-year professor at the, on this uh, university. And he wrote a PhD. It's Jack Schaefer. He wrote a PhD on text bridges. Then, so, after, when, as well, next. And he said with those six or seven words, you can uh, detect 90-something percent of all attempted omissions. Yeah, but then being the most important one. So I, I found this a, a striking coincidence that he uses then as an indicator for potential omissions, mm -hmm. uh, omissions, do not necessarily to be deceptive or, or lies. It just means something, you know, omits information, right? And you are using to a lesser degree, that's what I understood, yeah, to a lesser degree, you are, so you're waiting then different as, let's say, uh, main clause, subordinate clause, yeah, as a indicator of the next episode. It's, right? uh, it's based on, a, and I can't remember the author uh, of the paper, but There, there is uh, another linguistic author working in the, the 70s uh, who suggested then might be uh, a sub-episode. Rather than a main episode, it could be a sub-episode. Uh, And the thing with then is it comes as an adjunct. So you have all the other adjuncts, these little words you put at the start of the sentence. Afterwards, later on, Uh, or, or you have the adverbs uh, uh, initially, you know, I thought, whatever sort of thing. So all these adjuncts uh, also suggest uh, information, uh, episode constructions. And by the nature of episode constructions, there is an omission. By the jumping of something has been omitted, Uh, it's not necessarily lies, it's just that the author may not consider that information uh, useful relevant. or helpful or relevant. But it does, by the nature of episode creations, you do have a lacuna of some sort in, in between the previous and the next episode. I would still like to cover your contextual audience analysis toolkit. If we may, I know I jumped now from one topic uh, topic to the other, um, but I think it's a very interesting one. Before we do, yeah. So I know it's the it's Grice or Greece, Grice, Greece cooperative, Grice. Grice cooperative, cooperative principles. Then we have the relevance the theory and audience design. So I was aware, of course, of Grice. Um, I also was aware of the relevance theory. Audience design was new to me. But question first: Are there more components? that you're using in your contextual audience analysis, or are those the only three? Those are the basic, uh, those are the starting blocks. Okay. 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 So what else is there? What else is there? Uh, Because it's not in your book, so I'm curious. Okay. Um, those, so we're looking at uh, Grice's, um, uh, the maxims of communication, so all those. Uh, we're looking at Rel Sperber and Wilson's relevance theory, which is a psycholinguistics. Yeah. Um, so we're moving into the psycholinguistics aspects um, of it. Mm -hmm. And Bell's audience design. And so what those three look at together is the construction of information in a particular context. Okay, so... Uh, Grice looks at information provision from the speaker and then Bell uh, also looks at how the speaker constructs the information depending on the addressee, on the recipient. And so the easier to understand, the more relevant, right? Yes, that's that's right. The easier it is For the addressee to understand the more relevant will the addressee take the information yeah, it's the it's the addressee who determines yes, that is Sperber and yeah. Wilson so you have the speaker yeah. uh, on Grice the construction of the information taking into account the knowledge of the addressee that's audience design 
and then you have Bell, uh, then you have relevance theory is from the side of the recipient, what is relevant? And what is relevant mm -hmm. will depend on how easy it is for them to process the information. So the easier the processing, the more relevant the information. So those are the basic uh, theories, uh, well, the, the building blocks. So you're looking at information from one, the speaker, and from the recipient. And because Bell says that speakers tailor their uh, information for the recipient, and because Sperber and Wilson says the relevance, the speak, the recipient will find relevance depending on how easy it is to understand. So we have this two-way communication about how information should look like. Now, if you um, fake communication, you have this disconnect between the intentions of the speaker and the knowledge of the recipient, or the knowledge of the obvious and the actually intended recipient. And then into all of that as well, I start looking for um, linguistic strategies of pers persuasion. So that is the fourth element. Like? There are many different yeah. strategies. How does one persuade the other okay. to, um, to believe what they're saying? Um, you have mm. uh, in the book, uh, the chapter I wrote uh, in the book you have, there, we have examples of um, two different uh, of strategies of persuasion. One is of, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the word, of um, knowledge, of a knowledge base. It's not what I call it, but I can't think of the word at the moment. It's basically, oh, of expertise. Persuasion, uh, a persuasion strategy is when an individual claims expertise, says, here are my credentials, believe what I say. And so this is. And in um, another linguistic strategy can be when expertise is attributed by somebody else. So it's, that's a different approach. Uh, I am the expert and somebody else is saying you are the expert. So you have those. And then the third is the application of jargon. Abbreviations, yeah, yeah. So so you have jargon normally is the case when you have uh, two people from the same background in the same industry speaking to each other mm -hmm. and it facilitates uh, communication, having to explain, by just using the jargon. There comes a point when jargon just becomes gobbledygook. So it sounds technical but it actually doesn't mean anything and this is another uh, uh, strategy that's also in that in that case and there are yeah. many different other strategies and you just have uh, and you use linguistic uh, devices you know uh, that to to sound convincing or to convince your recipient of the the truth of what you're saying and there's just too many to to name and so it's on a, a, a by basing your analysis first on the on the building blocks you know is this information consistent with what we know about the speaker and what we know about the recipient and is it relevant and if it starts falling down on any of those uh cooperative principle by violating a number of maxims, if it starts uh, falling apart because it doesn't, the information being provided, um, the linguistic strategy is not consistent with who we know the recipient is. And when you start getting information that doesn't appear relevant and you then want to say, well, why is it here? All those questions then lead you to question, well, what is the communicative purpose of 
this communication. And then, you know, you can then start to use the linguistic, the, the persuasion strategies to identify well, what is it that the speaker or the recipient, because in an emails, the speaker becomes the recipient of one email and the recipient becomes the speaker in another email. So what is it they're trying to communicate? And that's what it boils down to, the communicative purpose of the, of the document. I think you referred now a num and it's a perfect segue. Yeah, you referred a couple of times now uh, to the example that's in your book, which I really would like you to outline here. Yeah, so chapter eight is an example where, and you mentioned it already. There were I think a number of emails between two uh, senders and receivers. So if you can elaborate on that specific example because it's a brilliant example it's it demonstrates the incredible power of the words yeah and the incredible um insights one can gain by simply analyzing the words right as opposed to nonverbal communication right so if you could if you could somehow encapsulate at the end of our interview and i know i'm i'm overstaying my welcome already we're over the top of the hour yeah but if you could encapsulate first of all what was the case yeah i mean you don't have to go in every single detail yeah but your insights i found uh fascinating because it's it goes over and beyond semantics linguistics you know even pragmatics there you know it's it's a real detective work yeah it also shows insights into the processes that the that the, the the writer or writers used, yeah. So there was real detective work involved here, yeah. But that's that's now me ending my my little prelude here. So if you can, can you can you kind of outline, explain, and elaborate on that specific example that's right. in your book in chapter eight? Um, as I said earlier, this was a fraud investigation, and I was sent this string of fifteen emails. I think. Uh, seven were written by one person and the other eight were written by the other. Um, so this was uh, a communication between um, a, a Swiss individual and an American banker. And the emails being exchanged were uh, uh, financial information. The situation was that the the Swiss individual had investments in the U.S. which he needed to um, uh, to cash in, and the American banker was supposed to be assisting him and advising him on this process. The uh, as an aside, is whenever I train, teach people, I always say, listen to your gut feeling. Because if your gut feeling tells you you are reading something and something does not seem right, you know, there is a problem. Don't try and talk yourself out of it. Because subconsciously, we do understand when communication is not right. And this is what happened to the fraud investigator who read these emails and thought something is not right here. And he sent them to me and asked me to have a look at them. And his initial thought was maybe there is an authorship problem. Maybe the person who they are investigating did not write his own emails. Um, so somebody else wrote them. So maybe that's, that's the issue here. And so he gave me a little background, very little about the, both people who are real people, you know, the real American banker, the real Swiss individuals. And when I started to look at the information, um, it in the very first two emails, there were certain violations of the Gricean maxims which suggested there was a question over which emails came first. Did the first email actually go out before the reply came in? Or did the reply, what appears to be a reply, 
could have been the actual first email. So at the very start, just by the way the information was provided, there was already an issue as to the chronology of these emails. And as I went through the uh, emails, one of the first, uh, it was increasingly obvious that given what both people's backgrounds were, both were bankers, both you know, worked in very high finance, that the inf in some of the information being provided first was very low level. So why was this explanation going on as if to somebody who didn't understand finance when both were very experienced? It didn't match up. There was also a lot of technical jargon which didn't make sense. I, as a fraud examiner background, I work a lot in uh, financial fraud and I knew that information just didn't make sense. And if both individuals were very experienced, why were they not questioning? So you are right, this goes over the linguistics this starts to ask questions of why are certain people behaving in certain way given the linguistics which they should be challenging. And so um, I will cut to the whole to the end uh, what it did turn out. I went back to the client, I wrote a report, I said these are all these problems. Uh, with the language and the relevance and the client then commissioned me to do an authorship analysis of both emails, both sides of the emails and it turned out that the Swiss individual was writing both sides. So not only his side but also the American side. And um, armed with this information, the fraud investigators contacted the American banker who denied he knew the Swiss individual and denied writing. So and at that point, that's where my um, involvement ended. So uh, I do not know what happened to the rest of the investigation. And this is the problem with my sort of work. Um, unless it goes to court, I, I don't know what happens because my role or the role of QED is to assist with investigations largely and um, most civil cases, which are, you know, corporate cases, just do not go to court. They take the information and I don't know. It's a fascinating example. Um, when I started to read the chapter, you know, you think you know where it's going, yeah? But in every paragraph, you know, the story took a different turn. And at the end, it turns out that the right, it was a single writer, but he wrote it for, a, for an intended audience, which was not mentioned or addressed in those emails, yeah? I'm just wondering, do you have any inclination on who or what this, this unnamed, you know, uh, third party was for which those emails actually were intended. I do. I was told who. Um, yeah. no, I, 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 I don't mean. Uh, I don't need. I don't need a name. I, well, I'm more generally I say speaking. I was told. I was told of the suspicion of the fraud examiners, hmm. and uh, basically, I, I can't say it was written for a family member who was who had no financial. Um, expertise okay. at all. Okay. So it was basically Understand. the emails were written for someone who was a completely different audience profile to yeah. the authors. Yeah. And you saw this video analysis, you knew that, I mean, you, you read it in the book, you knew that these emails were written for an, for an mm -hmm. audience other than the obvious ones. So again, a fascinating read, a fascinating read. I have one last question, if I may, yeah? Because I saw in, uh, oh, I think it was in your book, yeah? Masquerading political propaganda as newspaper facts, yeah? So in our challenging times today, when you read newspapers or hear news on, 
on television or in other media, does your analytical mind automatically kick yes. in? And what does yes, it tell it you? Yes, it does. Um, this is the problem, is you can't switch off. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. what you were saying was an example of the falsification of context. We, we see news, you know, news reports, and we're given all the information. But what we're increasingly seeing is the use of news contexts for political propaganda. And this is where you're then given a very slanted information or very focused Uh, information on a particular point of view, on a particular point of politics, and but it is presented as um, independent and objective news. And uh, like the fraud investigator who gave me these emails, um, I then do start to think something's wrong here. The problem with, writ with speech is it happens too fast. And this is why I prefer to work with written text. So I can work with verbal, but it has to be written down. And then you have the time to analyze it. But when you're hearing political propaganda provided as in the context of news, it's just happening, to, going on too fast to be able to, to focus or pick out what exactly is wrong. But... Uh, yes, my, my brain does start to, I sit up and I think, hang on a minute. But I am sure you would notice it too. And I'm sure other people notice it too. And I'm going to take this opportunity to go back to something you said at the beginning about how uh, De Polo, uh, Bella De Polo said, we are good um, at identifying deception. However, it is making that leap between thinking something is not right to it's not right because we're being lied to. And we don't make that leap. And, it's, uh, and that is why we end up not identifying the deception. 99.9% .9 of a deception is never identified at the time of the deception taking place. It's always identified later on and in the light of additional information that's been provided. But I think, going back to this political propaganda as news, if more of us did question, hang on, that doesn't sound right, so why doesn't it sound right? Then, um, yeah, I think we would be identifying far more, not only just deception, but I would prefer to think of as fake contexts. And that's what my area is. It's the faking of the context. Um, the information may be true, but it's in the wrong context. Um, you know, it's the, the story may be right, but it's in being presented in the wrong context. The conversation may have been taken place. It's in the wrong context. False confessions, they're in the wrong context. Uh, and that's how they get disco discovered. So it's all about, at least as far as I'm concerned, my interest is in the falsification context because that's where you identify the lie taking place. It's not the actual lie, but the context that's, uh, that's crucial. You're absolutely right. We are evolutionary programmed to believe the truth. Yeah? Truth bias is a very well-known phenomenon. It's very well researched and it's very solid. So we tend to believe the truth even if mm -hmm. the lie is literally staring us in the in the face okay isabel it was a fascinating conversation i thank you so much for your time i really enjoyed it i hope the same was true for you um i'm very grateful for the time you have uh, you have spent i read your chapter eight several times yeah and i look forward to having the time to read the rest of the book again a, a very um, good demonstration how how powerful words actually are and how misunderstood words often are because on one side people think they have much more control about what they are say than they actually do right and on the on the other hand we underestimate the power of the words right so thank you very much for your time thank you very much for writing this book and uh, i wish you all the best for the future 
Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Acquiring a new skill set takes time and dedication, and not everyone can do what it takes. But if you came this far, you're one of the few. Congratulations, you are ahead of the pack. And now, as promised, a practical example. In the next sentence, which comes from a real FBI investigation, it is one word that gives the lie away. Listen closely. Somebody came from behind, put something over my head and put me into the car. I say it once more. Somebody came from behind, put something over my head and put me into the car. What do you think? Most people instinctively vote for somebody or something because these words radiate vagueness and show that the speaker does not commit to what he or she is saying. But what really gave the liar away is the definitive article the from the car. Think about it. If someone sees a car for the first time, it would be a car, right? Only once the car has been introduced, it becomes the car. His car, her car, this specific car. It turned out that the female speaker had staged her own kidnapping and it was the definitive article D that gave her away. If you did the little self-experiment mentioned in the introduction, you already know how little control we have over some type of words. And that's it for today. Consider liking and subscribing if you appreciate the content. It costs you nothing and helps this channel. Thank you for watching.